My name is Matthew Barton, and I'm the host of the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. One of the geekier, more technical aspects of brewing is the recipe. But when you dive deeper, you'll realize that recipes are like transformers. They're more than meets the eye. Behind each recipe is a wealth of unspoken knowledge, years of experience, and a vision to achieve something better than last time. That's why I'm excited to welcome back Vanessa Owen. She's one of Rebellion's brewmasters, and she kicks ass. She's a mastermind behind some of our most creative and innovative beers. Today, we're going to pull back the curtain and look at what goes behind the scenes of creating the next beer recipe. So let's get into it. Vanessa, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Uh, great Transformers reference. <laughs> uh, love it. <laughs> I was a child of the 80s. So, uh, so was I. <laughs> so I was like, yes, I recognize that. <laughs> How's it going? Good, good. Excited to, I don't know, talk about weird recipe things because that's my favorite part of brewing. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons we picked recipes as the theme for today is it feels like you're on a roll with brand new recipes. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's true. I feel like I'm always working on something and then some of them work out and then some of them don't work out. But the ones that we're rolling out now have gone through a lot of steps, right? The full rollout just doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of testing that we do behind the scenes. Let's start at the very beginning. What would be a very typical process for a Rebellion recipe? Um, well, so I like to think about flavors. I like to, if I see a new type of malt that comes out or a new experimental hop or something, I'm usually like itching to get my hands on some. Um, and I read about the flavor profiles, but then also I just feel inspired by, I don't know, something that I see or someone mentions something. And I'm like, how would that taste in a beer? <laughs> and, uh, so we have a, a little test batch system so we can do a 40 liter batch. And that's great because that's when we can really see how do these flavors work together. And from there on, we We'll do a batch and then we'll tweak, tweak, tweak until we're happy. And then if, if the final product everybody likes, we'll do a full batch. When you're seeking feedback, how does that work? Um, well, sometimes it will be as simple as giving you a sample and then you say, why does this have lactose in it, Vanessa? I can't drink it. <laughs> or um, I like to have the whole brew crew. Uh, taste everything and we like talking about it and talking about flavors we talk about what we taste and maybe what what we've added but we can't taste we've got to up that quantity next time or should we put a little dash of vanilla in this or what I I don't know we talk about it and um and we take it from there and then we'll tweak it what have you had the most success with in terms of ingredients turning out the way you wanted to um, well, our recent, uh, cucumber jasmine beer, which I think some people really liked, and then some people were really on the fence about, um, it was just exciting because I had been wanting to make a cucumber beer for a long time. And then I finally made a test batch. And then a year later, I got to make the test batch again. And then the big batches, I don't know, th those, those are like my little beer babies and they like grew up and they got canned and they're off on their own now. So I'm really excited about that. And so, and with the watermelon goes that we have, or goza, however you want to say it, um, that we have here today, this is another beer baby <laughs> that um, started as an exploding cask on a Labor Day <laughs> classic weekend. And now it's all grown up and in a can and going out to the world. It was a Rough Rider inspired beer? Yeah, yeah. If we, uh, he, there's like, well, I, I wouldn't say it was like Rough Rider, but we were looking like, can we, can we put some melons in beers? Let's 
give watermelon a try. And I like watermelon because it's not super strong flavored. It's light. Um, but that's also one of the reasons I was nervous to work with it. Like, will we even taste it? Um, but I think you can taste it. I don't like working with artificial flavors. Uh, so uh, we had to try and dial in um, how much watermelon that we can put in um, in this style of beer. And since it's uh, a slightly sour style, uh, we had to up it a bit more so you can taste it through the, the tartness. But um, I, I think it turned out well. If you could ballpark it, how much watermelon is going into this kind of beer? I cannot ballpark it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we we got our hands on some puree. I, I'm not sure I can tell you how many like individual watermelons, but I would say like uh, not as big as a football field. <laughs> is that... <laughs> Does that qualify as a good answer? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we didn't put it in the boil or the fermenter. It went through the hot back or, or the torpedo? No. Uh, we added it to the... Yeah, we torpedoed the fruit in. Um, you don't have to do it. It it We torpedoed it due to how we received the puree. Uh, but if it would have come in a different format, we would have just added it to the fermenter. Oh, Okay. What is the risk or danger of working with melon? Well, I think uh, there's like a risk when you add any type of fruit or I guess vegetable um, because there's different sugars and, and stuff in there. So it also you're hoping that it's a good quality as well. So um, we we have been really happy with the quality of fruit that we've been able to get our hands on. So, um, yeah, just quality. Uh, and I don't know, residual sugars and stuff are sometimes a worry, um, especially when you're canning product, uh, because you wouldn't want like a secondary fermentation. That would be mean exploding cans. And nobody wants that. <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking about residual sugars, you're meaning sugar that can um, be consumed by yeast? Yeah. And then... <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Like it... Um, the yeast loves to eat sugar and we like it when that happens because that makes beer. <laughs> so, um, but at some point we need it to stop. So we need to make sure that our yeast has done its job. We get rid of it and then we add more sugar and is through the fruit. So, yeah. What are the risks these cans could explode? Like oh. slim to none? This is going sideways. <laughs> I want to be on record saying it's very slim, um, but we always do say keep it refrigerated as well. Um, we work really hard um, to make a stable product. Uh, we don't use a filter. Um, so, I mean, I guess there's a, always a risk, uh, but we work really hard with our centrifuge to reduce a risk. So between... The variables of year-to-year -year crops or rain-to-rain -rain crops. It's like you guys are trying to, to do work on an engine on a truck that's barreling down the highway at like 100 miles an hour. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like a transformer truck? What? what? Sure. Well, just you guys <laughs> are like mad scientists. You're figuring out how to make something that's super tasty. And it's like, but we still have to worry about this thing that's completely... Well, Beyond our, like, 100% control. That's, that's, I think, any brewer is working with that because that's, like, every crop of barley, the, like, water content in your barley, the percentage is different. Like, everything is subject to change. So just, like, learn how to fix shit. <laughs> that's, that's what I live by. <laughs> One of the things we did, I think it was a week ago, was Mark's old English IPA. Yeah. And I recall you saying that's how they used to taste. Yeah. Um, uh, I think one of the things, so, I mean, I don't know how long I've been like in the brewing world, not a super long time, but since I've been brewing, I don't know, 2010 or nine or something, uh, beer has changed so much. Like uh, just, it's, 
I don't know. It's it's exciting and overwhelming, and I love it. But um, there's some of these like old classics, the English IPA, that style of beer, that was the IPA, and so some of the the brew crew members have never actually tried an IPA like that before. So it was really like exciting warehouse uh, puts out a really nice bitter too. Um, I went and bought some of that not too long ago and we tried it and um, yeah, it, it's really nice. And it's that English style. Um, and it's been really going in the hazy direction, which is a, a different flavor profile, juicy, tropical, that kind of thing. And uh yeah, I don't I don't know. It's exciting to like go back to the classics. You're like a a beer historian. Uh, you get to go <laughs> back in time right. with old recipes. Well, yeah, I I do like doing that. That's uh one of my like nerdy little things that I like to do. I love reading beer history. Um so I, I don't know, how recipes, how styles were created and that's really exciting to me. So, um I would say, in my mind, from what I've seen or observed, your most popular beer this year has been the Cheryl Tovey tribute, the Blood Orange Ginger Ale. What was the story behind that beer? Um, well, uh, International Women's Collaborative Brew Day on International Women's Day, March 8th, um, uh, the International Women's Collaborative Brew Day has a theme every year, and this year it was tribute. And so I, there's no one who screams beer more to me uh, than Cheryl, Cheryl Tovey. So I said, we're making a beer in your tribute, to tribute to you uh, and what you've done for the beer community. And uh, she's the one that we, we sat down and we worked out, and she wanted a, one of the beers she had tried had that she really liked had figs, um, ginger, raspberries, and orange in it. And I thought I can maybe just do like two of those. (laughs) Uh, So we ended up trying the blood orange ginger. So was it what you expected when it came out? Um, no, (laughs) it wasn't. Well, a lot of things changed. That's, uh, just even how we packaged it changed. So, um, it was different. Um, that was my first time, uh, on a big scale adding ginger too. So I just kind of had to go with what I thought. And then I ended up getting some ginger paste and some of it was a bit spicier than expected. And uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I learned a lot. I, it's a good beer. I learned, I learned from it. So it is kind of my nemesis because it is lactose. Yes. Why would we add lactose to a beer? Like uh, I get that question a lot and I, I try to explain, but I'm like, I'm going to have Vanessa tell. Well, it's creamy and sweet. Uh, that's why, um, there's like a lot of milkshake beers out there and stuff and you would get a creamy sweetness, um, when you add lactose. Um, yeah, it, it, you can get like a kind of a creamy mouth feel in your beers if you're adding like lots of wheat or oats, but this uh, brings just an added little sweetness there too, and it really smooths it out. So um, it depends on what you want to achieve with your beer. Does lactose uh, sugar does it ferment? It you don't want it to. <laughs> uh, you don't ever want it to ferment. So you you just have to. Um, it does a little bit and it might boost up the, it depends how you add it. There's, there's different ways. If you're adding it to your boil, then it's already in there, right? So it'll probably bump up your gravity and your alcohol content in your beer. But if you add it post, which is more dangerous, you could potentially have it ferment. When you say gravity, what do you mean? Oh, um, just uh, and how you would measure the sugars in your beer, and that's how you would keep track of uh, your fermentation. So if if you you usually have a projected um, number that you want to hit, and then if you don't hit that, if it's too high or too low, then your alcohol content will be different than what you 
want it to be. I don't know. <laughs> Is that, <laughs> that's how you, that's your measuring tool. When it comes to recipes, what's one recipe that has turned out not at all how you expected, but it was still okay? Uh, I think that like, I don't know. I don't know if I can name just one because I'm thinking along the lines of like exclusive beers that we make the little, the every Thursday, that's when we get to be our most creative. And sometimes we'll make a beer and you're like, whoa, that was something that, you know, we've never worked with before. And we're like, whoa, that is way different than what we in, like anticipated, but it turned out well. I kind of, well, I brought, I brought something for you to try. Okay. That is going to be um, an exclusive on on the 30th, July 30th. Okay. Let's try it out. Okay. Now, <laughs> we've never used some of these things before, these ingredients. It's not yet carbonated, Matt. Okay. So, um, it just came straight Straight over. It's almost ready. So the color is kind of uh, a burnt orange, yeah. would you say? Yeah. We'll give it a sniff here. Yeah. <laughs> Lightly citrus? Am I, am I correct? I, I can just let you. I'll let you. You may have never had a beer with these things in it before. But maybe you have. I don't know. It's a little, it's, it's smooth, but it's not carbonated, right? Right. So right. do you ever go camping? Does yep. it taste like camping? Does it taste like camping? This is not marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, it tastes like camping to me. A little campfire smoke. Yep. Did you add smoke to it? No. So, um, one of the exciting things that we can do, especially, uh, really utilizing the cool things that we have in Saskatchewan, um, is in air ranch. They reached out to us and said, Hey, we've got all these really cool things. Do you want to make beer with it? So in here we've got a uh, birch bark and, uh, it's a gruit. So no hops, but instead of hops, we added rose hips. Uh, so, um, it's kind of like a Northern Saskatchewan beer. Uh, and it really does to me taste like camping. I've not brewed with birch bark before we, when we were doing it, Neil was brewing it on the test batch. And when he added it, the smell, the aroma that filled the, the brewery, we're like, oh, it smells like a campfire. It just smelled so unique. And uh, it's got a real earthy smokiness, but with a, a hint of sweetness and the little touch of bitterness from the rose hips. Definitely a unique beer and uh, definitely had no idea it was going to turn out like this uh, because we didn't know how it was going to turn out, right? We're like, let's just see what happens. It kind of, um, it has a really herbal Yeah, definitely, character. definitely. But the smoke I didn't pick up until the very end. It was kind of like scotch where you like exhale oh, yeah. and you're like, oh yeah, there it there is. There it is, yeah. <laughs> it's, I don't know, I, I, I'm really intrigued by this beer. It'll taste a little different once it's carb too. We'll see if that punctuates the rose hips. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but <laughs> we'll see. I think I've had about five or six gruits in my lifetime. And this is probably my favorite. Oh, really? Because I don't like them. Oh. Generally. <laughs> well. I like I have them. I'm like, yeah, next. But this was not bad. Oh, thanks. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. No, I thought I'd bring something like weird that one of the weird creations in the back in the <laughs> laboratory. <laughs> my big question was. What were you teasing me with, with the coconut and the lactose one that I can't have? That's this Thursday. That's this Thursday? Yeah. So after, well, that'll happen before the broadcast, but what, what's that one? Um, it's delicious and you can't have it. That's all <laughs> I'll say. No. <laughs> um, it's coconut coffee milkshake. Uh, so it's got lactose in it and it's just kind of like a wheat, wheat beer with some oats light nice and light it's like it almost with a coffee addition it looks like a blonde stout you know it's got that light complexion but that um rich coffee taste um caliber beans yeah which ones the ones that we just use in the brewery the sumatra yeah yeah i added some of that 
coffee, uh, coconut, uh, lactose, and a dash of vanilla. It's pretty smooth. Does it taste like drinking a cup of coffee? Uh, and coconut. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. So the added mouthfeel from the like slickness of coconut oil from the coconut and with the lactose is just like, it's a very filling smooth beer. I'd say. I feel like coconut really splits the crowd. It does. Like people who love it go bananas and bonkers for it. Yeah. And people who hate it are like, you just put pineapple on my pizza and I will cut you. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things I, uh, during one of the like sensory classes that we were kind of doing at the Lady Rebels, uh, I was doing some reading before it. And um, there's a percentage of the population that actually can't taste coconut. They can only taste um, artificial coconut. And so that's why in a lot of cases, when we have a coconut beer, there'll be people being like, I can't taste it any coconut but if we don't we don't add artificial flavor so if you're that in that percentage sorry (laughs) you're not gonna taste it in our beer (laughs) (laughs) is that like the same as the cilantro piece where some people it tastes like soap to them well i i don't know because they can still detect it right It, it might have a different flavor but they can detect it but in the case of coconut they can't taste it at all Really? Yeah. That well, that's what I saw in my readings. Would that be because they were born that way? Like it's a genetic thing, or I maybe think so. maybe they were smokers or something? Uh I think it's it's more a genetic because they were they were listing it as a solid percentage. You know, I don't know. Huh. When it comes to recipes, who challenges you or inspires you? Um, I think everybody. We have a really awesome crew. And we're all really excited about beer. And so we're always like, what about this? What about this? And we're always working. Like Zal came up with a, it's like a peated pear recipe that we want to try, a peated pear beer. And I was like, and should we add a dash of cloves? Yes, let's do the cloves too. And so we just like work together really well as a team. And I think that's how we get like some really great recipes. Peat as in like whiskey peat? Yeah. You can get pe- peated barley, peated malt. What, peated is, malt. what is that? It like tastes like whiskey, I guess. I, I don't know. Not whiskey, but like that smokiness. Like any, uh, you can get like smoked malt and peated malt. And pear plays nice with smoke. Yeah. How'd you even figure that out? Uh, Pinterest? I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know. We I read... I sometimes I go on Pinterest to see like flavor combinations, but then I have like spice books and stuff at home that I like to just see what, because it's not always like how it goes well, but it's like how it can, the contrast between the flavors are cool. Yeah. I don't know. And it's just like part just feeling like trying it. We, we had a, a hazy pear IPA uh, in November and we've been wanting to use pears again since then. Are pears kind of delicate like melons or other fruit? Yeah, it, they're not super strong. So yeah, yeah, they're just there for a little added something. Can you use like a pear puree concentrate kind of? What do you do? You could, yeah. Um, we're just going to just uh, get some pears. And for the test batch, it's not a big deal. You can put a little extra work in because it's 40 liters. It's not like thousands of liters. So we, we'll just get some pears and free, usually freeze them after we get them ready just to make sure they kill some weird bacteria if they have any <laughs> safety first. And then you're just going to like blend them or scrape them, scrape the skin off or anything like that or just toss the whole thing in? I, I would probably, I would take the skin off and I would cut them up and put them in the freezer nice that's what i would do (laughs) is there a recipe you will never ever do again and you were like this is a bad bad thing uh oh well the one time i've added like extract to something i only did it because i love a good theme and we were having an elvis impersonator I absolutely hate bananas. I absolutely hate any banana style beer. 
it goes against everything. I just hate it. Um, but I made a peanut butter banana beer that unfortunately was very popular. Beloved. People Ugh. were raving about that one. Barf. <laughs> I did it for Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when people were telling me how great that was. I'm like, I bet Vanessa's spinning. <laughs> I, I... It, I hated that I thought to do it. I wish I, but I was like, oh, peanut butter, banana. We have to kind of do it if we're getting an Elvis impersonator. But you'll eat banana on its own. I will not. Oh, you will not. I don't even want to look at one. <laughs> I hate bananas. Bananas, your Alamo. Uh, yes. <laughs> You're like, I'm here and here no further. I, uh, no, I, <laughs> if somebody's eating one in the brewery, I'm like, you leave now. <laughs> 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 well if it's any consolation i am allergic to bananas you will never see me eating one or have it anywhere near you oh good <laughs> what's next what's next yeah. um uh for like weird beers yeah well uh one beer that i'm excited that's coming up is another beer baby of mine uh dedicated to my grandparents rhubarb crisp I, I brewed my first batch. I was on maternity leave and I just came in because I felt like brewing a beer <laughs> and I just brewed it. That was my first time brewing that recipe and I've brewed two test batches with it to tweak it and so we'll be doing the big batch soon and so I'm excited for that one. It's friggin' uncanny. When I tasted that, I was like, this is, this is just like Grandma Barton's. Uh, rhubarb crisp i remember it distinctly it took me back to my childhood yeah you nailed it oh good well i you know i hope that i can nail it on the big <laughs> batch system too uh you know every every system's different so hopefully well let's get into this watermelon yeah i'm already drinking it I've are you been quietly sipping <laughs> right here <laughs> right off the bat you get that aroma did you expect that it would do that, or were you just fingers crossed? Well, I mean, it. I think well, we were hoping it would do it. That <laughs> that's what it should do. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and you get just like the the tart, the tart, uh, tart aroma of a kettle sour. When you guys said this was a goza, I couldn't believe it because it tastes better than any goza I've ever had. Oh. Like, I, again, additionally, do not appreciate or enjoy that style. I think this is the very first Goza I've said, oh, I'd drink that twice. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Um, I think sometimes uh, with the style, um, it's it can be hard dialing in the amount of salt you want. Um, uh, if it's over salted, that could be, that can mess with, like, the balance. I don't know. Uh, I, I like the amount of salt in this one. Uh, we added coriander because I I like being traditional, <laughs> and then added the melon as I don't like being traditional. <laughs> the uh, one thing that it struck me was it kind of you get a little click, you know, you're like you get that pucker, and then I was like, this reminds me of Jolly Ranchers. <laughs> oh yeah, a lot of people have said that, and I think it's because um, well, I think. If you were to ask me, the best Jolly Ranchers were always the green apple and the watermelons. And so that's why I would probably think, oh, this like tart, tart like a Jolly Rancher. And it's got a bit of sweetness, not overly sweet, but there's still a little sweetness there. So I can see that why you'd tie them together. Do you think that this will be a one-off or do you think we'll do it again in the future? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think we just... Maybe. I think that's a good way to answer it because, like, what if we keep finding really cool things? We've got to, like, give those cool things a chance, too. <laughs> right? <laughs> the the pre-chatter, like, we haven't even shipped it out on trucks yet, as far as I know. This whole last week, like, uh, you could get, you could go to the tap room and pick some up. But otherwise, you couldn't get it anywhere else. The level of excitement is almost unprecedented. I haven't seen a beer reacted to so positively and so desired in years. Well, I think that um, there's been like a lot of people saying like, we want a watermelon beer. And 
we were only doing it like small scale, like doing special casks of it. And, and uh, I don't know. I think people just felt like this is the year they wanted to drink more watermelon. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Okay. Cheers, Matt. Rebels. Thanks for listening today. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our brand new Facebook group page, the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. As you know, we're proud to be affiliate members of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. If you're looking for more great shows, more great content, be sure to hop on the network and check out all the new episodes coming out. They're on Facebook, easy to find, Saskatchewan Podcast Network. As you know, the Sascraft beer scene is always changing, but I'm going to do my best to keep featuring all the new local beers coming out. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you don't miss out on a single thing. Thank you for joining the Rebellion. Thank you.